Well, welcome very much all of you uh, to this Open Borders webinar. This one has a title, which is really so interesting. It's on caste performativity and the politics of spectacle. And I know that uh, our speakers today, who will take complete charge of this session, have worked really hard to, to bring their work together and, and put it in dialogue. So this session will be led by Purna Chandra Naik from the School of Arts and Humanities at Nottingham Trent University in the UK, and Surya Simon from the School of Literature, Drama and Creative Writing at the University of East Anglia in the UK. And um, I'm sure I can tell Surya has just um, uh, received a doctorate, so congratulations. They are, they, both of them are early career scholars in the field of Dalai Literary Studies, and they're both trying very hard to kind of uh, broaden the scope in this field. And I think both of their work is, is really exciting, and I'm so delighted that they have joined us here today. Um, just as always, this webinar series is organized by Marina Rimsha, uh, our tech wizard. <laughs> who's in charge of everything, uh, and she's from the India and Indonesia program at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and of course Judith Misrahi Barak from the Research Center Emma at the University of Paul Valéry, Montpellier 3, who is joining us from India at the moment, and she may not be able to be here, you know, throughout the entire uh, time of the webinar, so if she has to leave, um, that, that is all planned. <laughs> And um, my name is Nicole Fiara, and I'm from the Postcolonial Studies Center at Nottingham Trent University. Please be aware that this session is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel on page on stage. So if you don't want to be on camera, please um, maybe just leave it off. And um, so without further ado, or no, just something about the, um, the layout. We will be, um, as I said, oh no, God, I can't find myself now that I've clicked off. Oh no, where are we? <laughs> oh, there we are. Sorry, I was, just, I was clicking around. So just in terms of uh, layout, since our wonderful, you know, doctoral candidates, or in fact, doctor, you know, we are a doctor at Surya, you're no longer a doctoral candidate. Since you're both so kind of, um, uh, in, in, on top of this, uh, of your work, and, and since you both have started this dialogue between each other, I just want to completely pass it over to you. Yeah? So you will both be running this show completely. They will both present, then they will create a dialogue that they, you know, that is based on, on getting to know each other's work over the last few weeks. And only at the end can, the, can uh, you as viewers join us. So if you have any questions, you're very welcome just to kind of put it in the chat and we will get back to you at the very end. And, but for now, please, everybody who's not speaking, please just to mute yourself. You can leave your cameras on, of course, it's always nice so that they so that I can see you. But otherwise, um, I'll mute myself too. And I will hand over to Purna and Surya. Thank you again so much for doing this. And I'm really excited to hear you talk more about your work. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole, Judith and Marina. Um, for this event and for giving us the opportunity to speak. Feel surreal when you still say I've got my doctorate because I feel I'm just still uh, stuck doing the doctorate. Feels good. Uh, I, and I'm sure Purna as well, we are really delighted to be here and we thank everyone who's joining us and who will watch the recording later on. So uh, Purna is going to present first. Uh, so let me just do the honors of uh, introducing him. Uh, so, as Nicole mentioned, uh, Pune Chandra Naik is a PhD student in the School of Arts Humanities from Nottingham Trent University. His thesis titled Reading the Rejected, Dirt, Speciality and Subjectivity, he examines dirt in underappreciated Dalit literary genres like songs, poetry and short stories. So I had a glimpse into what uh, Purna talks about and explores in his thesis and uh, prior to this event, and there are some really great ideas and intriguing concepts and perspectives, especially on um, Vasant Moon's seminal work, Vashti. So without taking much uh, time away, over to you, Purna. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Surya, for that generous introduction. And um, thank you, uh, Marina, Nicole, and uh, Judith as well for organizing this event and for this opportunity. And thank you to everyone for uh, for being here. So without further ado, I ju I'll just start my paper. Um, in his essay, Untouchables or the Children of India's Ghetto, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar observes that 
people in Indian villages are divided into two socioeconomically and geographically distinct sections, that is, the touchables and the untouchables. He claims that, quote, Hindus and the untouchables are divided by a fence made of barbed wire. Notionally, it is cordon sanitaire, which the untouchables have never been allowed to cross and can never hope to cross, unquote. He goes on to state that code of social conduct like distance pollution or shadow pollution condemn the untouchables to a life of perpetual poverty, vulnerability, and servitude in the segregated ghettos of Indian villages. It is for these reasons that Ambedkar encouraged Dalits to move away from Indian villages and migrate to cities in search of livelihoods and a new life. Gopal Guru and Jesus Chairas Garsa comment that in stark contrast to space in villages, Ambedkar considers the urban space as a site of possibilities for the emancipation of Dalits. In this paper, I explore the enabling possibilities of urban space by examining the life writing Vasti, Vasti uh, by the prominent Ambedkarite Vasan Munt. In Vasti, which has been translated into English as Growing Up Untouchable in the India, a Dalit autobiography by Gail Ongved. Vasan Moon provides a vivid account of Dalit life in an urban slum or urban neighborhood in Nagpur, Maharashtra during the first half of the 20th century. Eleanor Zelliot contends that by the end of the 19th century, the shift of Dalits, particularly Maha Dalits, into new occupations in cities created a new sort of Maha who was educated and had, and had gained a sense of self-respect. Vasan Moon's life story is situated in this Maha Dalit legacy in Nagpur. The Dalits inhabiting the slum, urban slum, are employed in wage labor in the cotton mills and the railways. For instance, Vasan Moon tells us that 40 to 45 percent of labor force in the textile mills in Nagpur was comprised of Maha Dalits. He remarks, quote, the condition of our people improved because of the textile mills. This is important. Many people in our community even today hold positions as jobbers, masters, and so on in the mills, unquote. However, this, their special location in the city not only enabled Dalits to earn wages in cash and gain a degree of economic security, but it also opened up possibilities for socio-political awakening in Nagpur. The Samata Sanik Dal, or the Army of Equality, was the pivotal organization through which Dalits are initiated into the Ambedkarite process of political literacy and self-fashioning in Nagpur. The Samata Sainik Dal had been established by Dr. B. R. Ambedkar in 1927 to spread education amongst Dalits and protect them against attacks and intimidation from others. In fact, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar was so impressed by the activities of the Samata Sainik Dal that he described it as a movement. He writes, quote, the objective of this movement is to inculcate the spirit of discipline and spread the message of the new era among the untouchables." Unquote. Vasan Moon tells us that the Samata Sainik Dal established its branch in his neighborhood in 1938 and held regular meetings in the open field in front of the Mahapura in the slum. Subsequently, Dalits, particularly young Dalits, started joining the Samata Sanik Dal, in which they were trained in self-discipline and self-defense. Vasan Moon recounts that, quote, there was a parade of the Samata Sanik Dal every day. We learned things like, we learned things that were taught in the military, such as left, right, left, about face, right turn, left turn, slow march, halt, slope arms, with sticks like rifles in our hands, unquote. This training and participation of the Dalits in the Samata Sanik Dal must be seen in the light of the fact that before the formation of the Samata Sanik Dal branch in the neighborhood, the Dalits of the neighborhood used to join the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh or the RSS. When the Samata Sanik Dal started its activities in the neighborhood, it not only weaned Dalits away from the RSS, but it oriented Dalits towards the emancipatory path of Ambedkarism. And in this transformative process, Dalits transformed the open space in front of their neighborhood into a catalyzing arena where they forced their Ambedkarite identity as an autonomous and independent political identity in contrast to both the RSS-led hegemonic Hindu identity and MK Gandhi-led nationalist identity. In addition to the open field in front of the neighborhood, Dalits repurposed the roads, the Maidan of Nagpur into platforms 
where they conspicuously express their consciously forged Ambedkarite identity and politics. Thomas Bloom Hansen contends that in order to study the study and comprehend the political in India, quote, performances and spectacles in public spaces from central squares to street corners in the slums must be the focus of our attention, unquote. He claims that along with the performances and spectacles, speeches and images are the most generative of political movements, the core of political society, and the location where historical imageries and notions of community become visible and effective. All these are part of what Hansen calls the political performativity, which also involves a certain way of dressing and behaving in public that endows the identity of a movement, define its members, and advance its cause and worldview. The 1940s were a period of great political ferment during which the MK Gandhi led nationalist movement dominated the political discourse on the subcontinent. Swimming against the nationalist tide, the Ambedkarite movement conceptualized its alternative political society on a pan-Indian level. Drawing on Hansen's concept of political performativity, we can see how the Ambedkarite political movement is expressed and disseminated by Dalits through songs, speeches, images, and spectacles in public space in Nagpur. For instance, writing about the flag hoisting ceremony of the Samatha Sainik Dal, Vasan Moon proudly asserts that the blue flag symbolized our pride. And while raising the flag, care was taken that it, its edge should not touch the ground or any dirt. The song which was collectively sung during the flag raising ceremony gives us a glimpse into the Ambedkarite political imagination. The song goes, quote, waving always in the skies, our beloved flag of freedom, the 70 millions of Dalit people today vow their lives to the flag. The sight of you inspires us. We will uproot tradition in an instant, unquote. In contrast with the nationalist thought, Ambedkarites express an alternative vision of society and freedom through the, black, through the blue flag and the song. And in contrast to Swaraj, reclaiming equality is expressed as the Dalit birthright. The Samatha Sanik Dal members vocally proclaim the equality of all Dalits as an indispensable right which had been stolen from them at birth by the caste system and which they publicly vowed to reclaim now. This collective swearing of allegiance to the Ambedkarite political project in a declamatory fashion is not only addressed to the, to the Dalit public, it is effectively part and parcel of the political spectacle meant to be heard and seen by others in public space. The parades organized by the Samatha Sanik Dal in the streets of Nagpur during the run-up to the schedule, run up to the Scheduled Caste Federation Conference in 1942 ostentatiously bear this out. For instance, when the Samatha Sanik Dal members appeared dressed in the red shirt and the khaki pants uniform for parades, Vasan Moon recalls that, quote, People marveled at seeing the bands of red volunteers on every road in Nagpur, teams of militants began to walk in disciplined ranks through the city with rap, 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 performing military maneuvers, on, end quote. In addition to reflect, in addition, reflecting on the parades that followed the uh, flag hoisting ceremony mentioned, Vasan Moon gives another account in which he expresses what he as a young Ambedkarite felt. He says, quote, at the time, the whole affair was romantic for me, repressing hunger and thirst from morning to afternoon, all together on the main road of Nagpur, we turned the whole city upside down. The boys were hungry. We felt the vehement heat of the harsh March sun. Even then, everyone was enthusiastic. By the time we had circled the city and returned, it was two in the afternoon." End quote. In his study on Dalit processions, which passed via streets during the celebration of the birth anniversary of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar on 14 April uh, today, Nicholas Jaul describes them as a part of as part of an elaborate political language of street politics in the urban space through which Dalit contest their marginality. He reads the procession as a strategy of Dalit accession and remarks that the procession moves from one Dalit basti to next throughout the city, stamping its mark on the main road in a symbolic ritual of appropriation. 
Nicolas Joule's observations can be retrospectively applied to the mapping of the parrots outlined by Vasan Moon in the city of Nagpur. Vasan Moon pointedly draws our attention to the main roads and streets as sites that pull it, at the, as sites that Dalits momentarily overtake during the procession, making a gestural claim over these public spaces of the city. Along with the flag hoisting ceremony, accompanied by the blue flag, accompanied by the flag song, the parrots in military fashion and the paraphernalia of uniform adorned with the insignias of the Samatha Sonic doll constitute the political performativity of Ambedkar politics in the urban space of Nagpur. Vasan Moon says, "Quote: When the flag song was over, each branch went." Each branch went out to the main road in lines of three, in order, one after the other. With left, right, left, the entire red stream began to move ahead. Everyone had a stick in his left hand resting on his left shoulder, and the right hand moving up and down to the rhythm of his feet. The leaders of the platoons and companies wore long pants. A golden belt of four inches went from left to right to their chests. They wore insignia on their right arms, just as military officers had. On the shirt's shoulders was a tab, and on this, a blue band with the letter SSD, which obviously means Samatha Sanigdal. The stickers of most of the boys were only as long as their arms. Sorry, the sticks of most of the boys were only as long as their arms, but the cudgels of the young men were extraordinary." End quote. Vasan Moon provides a meticulous description of the dressing style and disciplined behavior of the Samatha Sanigdal branches. The elaborate uniform and self-assured body gestures illustratively refute the constructed image of the untouchables as poorly dressed, pitiful bodies. While the bearing of arms and the pattern of dressing suddenly invoked the Dalit military past and reiterated the martial Dalit history, this Dalit political performativity is very much oriented towards an Ambedkarite future. It is not for nothing that Vasan Moon depicts the Samatha Sanigdal branch parrots as red streams that march ahead, a splendid visual spectacle which he likens to that of the red Russian soldiers. After the parrot, the leader of the Samatha Sanigdal, Vaman Rao Godbole, tells the Samatha Sanigdal members, quote, Baba Sahib says sheep and goats are sacrificed, not lions and tigers. Yesterday we had a parade. People saw our strength. No one will cross us." Unquote. In other words, through these political spectacles, Ambedkarites visibilized themselves as an organized political movement to be reckoned with by others. The deep conviction to embody and disseminate the Ambedkarite political movement across the city space can be conceived from the fact that Dalits suppress pressing hunger to be part of the parade. In this way, the Dalits of the urban slum transformed roads, streets, and the city of Nagpur itself into effective spatial mediums through which they not only assertively registered their collective presence as an Ambedkarite community, but also promulgate the Ambedkarite politics in the wider public domain. Vasan Moon was raised by his mother Purnabai, who used to work in the mills, cotton mills in Nagpur. With her meager salary from the mills, she provided Vasan Moon with a life-changing education. Vasan Moon's life writing is a burning testimony to uh, burning testimony of struggle and fulfillment, not in spite of the poverty and scarcity in the slum, but because of the very um, because of the much-needed support and ambedkarit orientation that he, that he receives in the urban slum of uh, Nagpur. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, now I'll, uh, now I'll uh, introduce Surya. So she can uh, go ahead with her presentation. So Surya Simon is an associate tutor and a research associate at the University of East Anglia in UK, Norwich, uh, I mean Norwich, UK. She pursued her doctoral studies from the School of Literature, Drama, and Creative Writing uh, in the University of East Anglia in UK. Her doctoral thesis titled Performativity in Dalit Literature, Identification, Disidentification, and Reidentification in Contemporary Dalit Personal Narratives 
developed a new performative theory of caste to explore Dalit identity and agency. So um, I welcome Surya now to uh, present. Thank you, Purna, for that kind of introduction and uh, what an insightful and really interesting paper that was, Purna. Um, so my doctoral thesis analyzed translated Dalit personal narratives. And today I will take a few examples from two amazing narratives by P. Shivakami's The Group of Change and Bama's Karaka. So the Group of Change was translated by Shivakami herself, while Karaka was translated by the notable translator Lakshmi Holmstrom. Both narratives is set in Tamil Nadu in the late 20th century and predominantly focus on the experiences of the pariah communities. Both narratives offer deep revelations and depict what my thesis refers to as caste performativity. Now to understand performativity, I explored the ideas of the American theorist Judith Butler, specifically her ideas on uh, gender performativity. For Butler, Performativity involves a simultaneous act of signification and enactment. For example, there are words that are merely true and false statements, but performative words signify something and is simultaneously supplemented by an action. Performative words are not mere utterances because they involve an action. Hence, performativity is a dynamic process of simultaneous signification and action. Here it is important to remember that uh, performance is not the same. The performance I'm talking about is not the same as a theatrical performance where an actor leaves his role and uh, at the end of a play and returns to their true self. What Judith Butler means is practices as performances, social, cultural, economic, religious, political practices that individuals enact on a daily basis. Then in the context of gender, Gender becomes a performance because gender identity does not exist a priori to human relations, but is rather constructed by repeated gendered practices or performances by a dominant ideology. Why? Because identity can never be essentialized, and it is the work of discourse and ideology to make it appear essentialized. So dominant ideologies and discourses determine what constitutes gender identities, and over a period of time, such repeated gender performances essentialize or normalize gender identities and roles. A popular example is when a child is born, uh, the doctor declares the sex of a child, and from there on, social codes take over, pink for girls, blue for boys. And even when the child grows up, they are expected to perform according to their predetermined gender roles. Such repeated performances for generations reinstate gender identities, and this constitutes gender performativity. So this concept of gender performativity becomes instructive to exploring caste because the preservation of the caste system relies on everyday practices and social performances of caste. Let us look at an example from Bama's Karaka. <clears throat> so as a child, Bama recalls an incident where an elder from a street offered an upper caste man from the Niger community a small packet of food. The elder bowed low and then extended the packet to Niger using a string without touching the Niger's hand. This practice, Bama says, is driven by the popular belief that Nikers were upper caste and therefore must not touch priors. If they did, they would be polluted. Bama was sad and infuriated because how can the upper caste believe that it was disgusting if a pariah held that package in his hands? even though the food was wrapped in a banana leaf and then parceled in paper. <clears throat> Here it is important to note that the elder's gesture of handing out the food packet through a string and the Nika receiving it untouched shows how caste maintenance is a relational performance involving both so-called upper and lower castes. The fictionality of this practice is apparent in so far as the string and the outer packet itself would have been touched by the elder. Then the string's function and the entire performances of, of avoiding touch is strictly and purely symbolic and performative, not at all practical. When such caste-based performances are practiced for decades by both upper and lower castes, the ideology of caste and its significations are normalized and perceived by both groups as essential. In Karaka, Bama asserts that Dalits have been enslaved for generations upon generations 
And so they have learned to believe that they have degraded, lacking honor and self-worth. This situation is also articulated by one of the central Dalit characters in Pisha Bhattami's The Grip of Change, named Kalamutu, who's also from the Paraya community. Kalamutu declares that there is no place where caste doesn't exist and that caste will be around for generations yet to come. So such repeated hegemonic caste performances act as an affirmation of the caste-based significations and identifications. Caste performativity is ingrained in the social fabric of Dalit and non-Dalit communities. I use the term non-Dalit because we all know that Dalits can be oppressed in communities without any caste or savarna identity, such as in Christian or Muslim or other religious communities. The ongoing caste-based discrimination of Dalits, despite legal and political interventions, economic development, and religious conversions, points out the dominance of caste in the social sphere. <clears throat> in Annihilation of Caste, Ambedkar talks about how caste Hindus attempt to maintain an imaginary caste purity by preventing the intermingling of castes. Ambedkar states, and I quote, it is said that the object of caste is to preserve purity of race and purity of blood. Since there is nothing essential about caste, and since each body has no scientific or biological reason to be associated with a particular caste, apart from being born into a caste ideology, physical and visible aspects, uh, which I call sites of performativity, such as spatial segregations, names, and bodies, are exploited to normalize the divide between castes. So let's take a look at these sites of caste performativity. Space is a performative site is something I feel most of you all would be familiar with. That is caste groups living in different areas and different streets. Uh, Bama and Shivakami's works portray caste communities in distinct settlements, with not necessarily a tangible border or a boundary. It's an imagined boundary. Yet through lift separation, caste distinction is maintained on a physical level and is performed every day, thereby naturalizing caste divisions. Now let's look at name as a site of performativity. Caste identity can be noticed in the names, particularly surnames of upper caste groups. In the group of change, the upper castes are fueled with caste pride and they flaunt their caste ranking in their legal surname, which indicates which upper caste community they belong to. Other caste groups, including lower castes, refer to the upper caste by their surnames, thereby reinstating imagined upper caste superiority associated with caste ranking. This simultaneous signification and enactment of caste distinctions through name, caste performative. Let's take another instance from the group of change. Tang, a pariah woman, was assaulted by an upper caste group, and Kadamutu, the character I'd mentioned before, is helping Tangam seek justice. Now, Kadamutu changes the facts of the incidents leading to Tangam's assault, and in his version, an upper caste woman started abusing Tangam by referring to her caste name, Pachi. Here, Paraya is an identity which is not part of the legal name of individuals and is often used by upper castes in a derogatory manner to reinforce the lower caste status of the pariah community. It's the same performative process of uh, signification enactment that you see in upper caste naming, but with contrasting function and consequences. Hence, name becomes a performative site and the act of using caste name becomes a performative act since the utterance of the name leads to historical and social implications of ongoing caste practices. Next performative side is three. <clears throat> the performative nature of caste manifests itself by segregating upper and lower caste bodies based on ideological binaries such as clean versus dirty, purity versus pollution. In Karaka, when Bama was traveling on a bus, an upper caste woman asks uh, um, Bama where she's traveling to or from. And on knowing where uh, Bama's destination is, the woman asks her to go and sit in another seat, or demands her to move and sit in another seat. Uh, another instance uh, from the group of changes where one upper caste character cannot stand the comparison between um, musical instruments used by upper and lower caste. Radangam is traditionally used by upper caste, and you have the paramolam that is for centuries used by Dalit communities. And even the comparison between the beat of the Mrudangam and that of the Paramolam is seen as unacceptable by the character. Because the musical instrument's value is determined by which caste group uses it, 
because caste bodies or anything associated with the body, such as names, faces, musical instruments, food, acquire the status of their respective caste groups. Hence, Dalit and non-Dalit bodies become sites of performativity as both groups engage in repeated performances of caste. In Karaka, Bama, Bama points out that oppressed are taught about humility, obedience, patience, and gentleness as a way of conditioning them to accept their fate of what Amitka calls the dogma of predestination. Bama mentions that the upper class seem to conspire to keep Dalits in a submissive place, especially since they have worked throughout history like beasts and hence should live and die like that without ever moving on or going forward. Subordination, lack of dignity, humiliation, and other ideological caste differences are socially maintained through repeated performances because without a compliance to caste performances, the oppressed and abjected Dalits can rise and revolt. Then it can be said that the upper castes require the recognition and subsequent caste performances of the lower castes to function in the imagined caste superiority. This paradox of, or ambivalence of caste performativity is a result of the relational nature of identity and practices, wherein you need Dalits and non-Dalits, both groups to perform caste practices. And it is precisely this paradox or ambivalence resulting from the relational caste performativity that confirms and disturbs the existing social order of caste, and hence could also become the location of and for agency. Because to reiterate, caste and its performances are not at all essential and only perceived as essential by repeatedly citing them for years. So these performances can be changed or transformed by introducing difference into this chain of citations. How? Through resistance or non-conformity to caste significations and practices. For example, resistance, non-conformity, um, self-empowerment of Dalits have been underway for years. One example is Dalit literature, which has carved out a space for itself in a predominantly upper caste or non-Dalit dominated literary sphere. Another example is the rejection of imposed um, names such as outcasts, untouchables, origins. And this rejection is supplemented by the term Dalit identity formation and transformation is significant. And the 20th century has already seen several efforts made by Dalit leaders to carve out their distinct identity from caste and use. There are attempts to reclaim Dalit identity, such as um, Srinivasan, who used the term Pare to proudly assert his caste identity and mobilize groups. Here I must give credit to Dr. Malar Jain, uh, who is translating Ratmala Srinivasan's work and also um, shedding light on his legacy, through which even I came to know of this uh, amazing person. So we have resistance and non-conformity by Dalits, but resistance and non-conformity to caste should also come from non-Dalits. Otherwise, the burden of liberation from caste significations and practices would solely be on Dalit communities when the larger majority of non-Dalits continue to perform caste. Caste performativity is relational and hence requires relational reformation, that is, involving Dalits and non-Dalits. In my interview with uh, Arvind Malagatsi, a trailblazing writer from Karnataka, uh, I interviewed him as part of my doctoral thesis. Malagati states, and I quote, social change does not come by reading alone. Social experience is also quite important. Society is changing and high caste people are changing too. We, he's referring to his fellow Dalits here, we too should change. Non-Dalits should come two steps further and we should go two steps further. It should be mutual. Change will take place by the activity of both communities, not just by one community alone. Two hands are required for a clap. So to conclude, a deeper understanding of the performative nature of caste enables a better understanding of the social prevalence of the caste system and the need for relational reformation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Surya, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, we have some hands there clapping. <laughs> Interesting. So yeah. Thank you, uh, Alia. Yes. Shall we move on to the uh, question answer session? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Do you want me to go first? Um, yeah. Yes. Not? It can yeah? be kind of in in conversational way. way yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So I was really intrigued by the idea of uh, the concept of ghetto that you've used. 
know, Ambedkar uses it as well. And I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate a bit more on that and how space continues to be contested today. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that question. Yes. Um, yeah, as we know, Ambedkar is very much kind of, uh, I mean, he was an international scholar, so he draws from many traditions, you know, uh, the Black tradition, the Jews, to the Jews tradition, and so on. So he kind of contests that, uh, you know, uh, uh, to give a kind of uh, definition or origin of the word ghetto. So the word ghetto comes from the word ghetto, G-E-T-O, ghetto, Italian word basically. So in uh, in uh, early uh, decades of uh, 16th century, the uh, in the city of, you know, Venetian city, the Jews were basically kind of relocated uh, into this uh, place which had a, a copper foundry, the ghetto, G-E-T-O ghetto basically means copper foundry. So it was basically a copper foundry and that is where um, the name comes. Jews are kind of relocated there to kind of specially segregate them there, limit them. So uh, that's how the word from ghetto to ghetto kind of comes. But Ambedkar argues that, um, you know, uh, within this kind of segregated spaces uh, in 16th century, around 16th century, 17th century, um, uh, uh, Jews kind of uh, suffered and uh, flourished at the same time. It was a mixed baggage. Ghetto was a mixed baggage for them. But uh, then he kind of contrasts that kind of ghetto with the kind of ghetto that caste system creates and says that within Indian society in villages, you have these ghettos in villages where Dalits are like children. You know, they are the children of Indian ghettos and they, there is no scope for them to kind of grow, basically. There is forever remains children. And that's how he kind of compares and contrasts as to how um, uh, the village, uh, Indian village and the, all these kind of Dalit ghettos basically kind of limit uh, Dalit's life, Dalit life and kind of constrict and then uh, kind of, yeah, uh, kind of keep them down in, this, uh, in these ghettos. And that is how he kind of constantly urges Dalits to kind of move away from ghetto, move away from ghetto into cities, because first, you can get a get an uh, get a degree of anonymity, and then you can kind of diversify your occupation. Because if you're in a ghetto in a village, you do service. You don't do any kind of paid work. You know, whatever you do, whatever quote unquote service you do, render to the upper class. They pay you in kind. In you know, discarded clothes, discarded food, and so on. So there is no wage employment. So if you go to the city, at least you can get some wage employment, and then kind of um, you know uh, build up on uh, on that wage employment, and then explore. Uh, possibilities that happens in uh, you know this that, that we see in Vasan Moon's life writing was the thank you brother that's very interesting because I, I've also wondered with regards to my research you know how uh, I talk about spatial performativity and I would wonder how that uh, is out in um, a village get on an urban slum because there could be limitations to moving to the city as well as you've mentioned so yeah. You can go ahead if you want to talk more. About yes, that. yes, yeah, definitely. Yes, I mean, uh, it's not like you know, it's it's a kind of uh, from village ghetto to you kind of uh, end up in a heaven in urban space. No, no, by no means. I mean, it's it's still a kind of uh, you know uh, slum is we when it's a slum, urban slum, it it's a kind of the middle class uh, notion. It is still a kind of stigmatized space, and um, you know, it's the kind of dirt and um, you know all kind of shoddy things that happen there, and. Uh, um, Many Dalit writers explore this space, you know, um, particularly Dhasal, the kind of write, the poetry he writes about, uh, you know, urban slum and so on. So it's by, it is by no means a heaven for Dalits, but at, at least they can kind of, um, you know, hope for possibilities that we see in, in the emergence of Dalit Panthers in the 1972 and so on. So these are all movements that kind of emerged in, um, in, in urban slums. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, as far as the problems in uh, urban slum is concerned, I mean, there are many, I mean, absence of civic amenities, absence of, you know, uh, better opportunities. I mean, the kind of process, but at the same time, uh, in contrast to the village, um, village ghetto or village uh, uh, kind of all these segregated spaces, uh, urban space does kind of offer some kind of possibility to, to, uh, to, to Dalits. And that is how the, uh, that is why, particularly in Vasti, we see that in 1940s and 50s, how Ambedkar movement kind of, how space itself was so much uh, kind of um, invested in this Ambedkar project. It's the slum, urban slum, urban, uh, you know, BDD Charles and other, other places. In fact, uh, um, 
uh, Anupama Rao uh, writes a lot about uh, Bombay, Bombay being a Dalit city basically because of the cotton industry and because, because of the dogs and so on. She goes on to argue as to how um, this, this, this Bombay is basically Dalit Bombay and so on. Well, so that's very interesting. I do have other questions on spaces or if you want to, if you yes. have anything or we could. Yes, yes, urban space, yeah, that's what it is, yes. Yes, yeah, so I, I was also like, because we're anyway talking about space, that, that I'm, that's going to be my last question to you. I'm sure others would have a lot of other questions. So it's in terms of, you know, it's so interesting that you take poems and short stories and the songs is just wonderful that you've just recited here. I'm wondering, how does the physical space, because you look at spatial performativity in space a lot, mm -hmm. how is that translated into a literary space? Mm. space or vice versa does uh, the literary space reflect that or is it inspired by the physical space yeah well i mean the book itself is it's it's kind of when it is translated it is translated with the name growing up untouchable in india but you know the original name itself is vasti you know vasti uh, vasanmun kind of uh, relates with this space with a kind of um, affection i mean um, and it is it is a physical space but at the same time he um, relates to it uh, I mean, he invests human agency to this space. I mean, he kind of, um, uh, he relates to as, uh, as a kind of mother, as a nurturing space, so to speak. And, um, you know, when the, uh, after the uh, conversion, uh, 1956 conversion into Buddhism, the space, the Mahapura, uh, where they were living, was kind of renamed as Anand Nagar, the, you know, happy city or city of joy and so on. So the space itself is it's it's not a kind of uh, in, an inanimate um, you know object so to speak. It is kind of it it has it had it has agency and Vasan um, uh, Moon particularly invests with it with a with a, with, a, with a lot of uh, human characteristics. It is a space where you kind of you have a, f a feeling of community, hunger and many kind of uh, problems persist. But uh, within this space, there is a sense of community. There is a sense of belonging that you experience. And there are many instances actually, um, you know, uh, in the evening, um, they gather in a, in a barber, in front of a barber shop. In, in, interestingly, I mean, he couldn't pay for, uh, for a haircut and so on, which also kind of relates to Ambedkar's life. He, he, no, no one would cut Ambedkar's hair, so, you know, uh, his family members would cut his hair. So anyway, so uh, in front of this uh, um, barber shop, uh, Vasan Moon would uh, read newspapers actually to basically non-literate people, non-literate non Dalits. So, you know, uh, newspapers from Bombay and other major cities. And uh, uh, everyone would sit in front of, uh, in front of this, uh, this, this space, I mean, in front of the barber shop, and uh, Vasan Moon would read out newspapers to them. And it was also kind of a beautiful kind of way to look at how community kind of builds up in these spaces, you know, despite all the problems and, you know, insecurity in life and lack of civic communities and so on, how life kind of, that it kind of find hope, hopes, you know, despite all the, all these odds against them. So yeah, Vasan Moon kind of writes uh, about the space as if it, it was, it were a person, it were a nurturing, uh, caring person. Thank you, Purna. Thank you, Aish. I hope I, <laughs> Aish, I kind of uh, managed to answer your question. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think it was really insightful and we got enough. I think there was much more information as well that I'm sure you couldn't fit into your presentation. Yeah, came yes, forward. Yeah. It's, it's exciting. Yes, I mean, there, it, it talks a lot about, uh, you know, the Buddhist society and Buddhist literature, literary events and so on as well. So yeah, there is a lot to kind of do. And in fact, the mag magazines, you know, Ambedkar's magazine that, uh, that they read, uh, uh, read collectively, as I said, I have some questions that I would uh, like to ask you. Uh, you know, um, uh, both Karuku uh, and um, you know uh, Bama and um, you see Kam, you know, Yeah, the Dalit women authors and indeed uh, well-known Dalit women authors. I was wondering how the idea of um, idea of uh, performativity, perform performativity that you talk of, how does it kind of interact with the uh, with gender? How does um, you know, caste performativity and gender kind of interact and intersect, if you can speak a little about it. Yeah, absolutely, great question. Uh, so I'll give an example. Um, so in the grip of change, there is uh, the character that I've mentioned, Kadamutu, who is from the Paraya community. He has a conversation with Thangam. So Thangam is a victim of uh, 
rape and assault, and she has been raped by an upper caste, uh, her upper caste employer. So Kalamutu tells Thangam, see, you cannot be an upper caste man's wife if you were expecting that. A Dalit woman can never be an upper caste man's wife. He would be seen as a concubine or a sexual object. But Kalamutu uh, married an upper caste widow. And he says that, but I can do so because, again, his, his identity as a man really helps him there, even though both of them are from the same community. Another example that, uh, that is very distinct is uh, the idea of how Dalit women's bodies are seen as something that can be exploited, that is expendable, because it is associated with land, something that can be owned and exploited. So I got this uh, idea, I was inspired by uh, the article by Audra Simpson, The State is Man, where she looks at the idea of uh, Canadian Indigenous women's bodies and how they're associated with land. And mm. I found it instructive again to understand uh, Thangam's character in the grip of change because Thangam is a widow and she's claiming the right to her dead husband's land. But her brothers-in-law denies her the right to that land because one, she's no longer with a man because her husband passed away and two, she's not, uh, uh, she doesn't have children. So she is denied access to a fertile land because she is considered infertile. And it's so strange that land is seen as something that can be exploited and expendable. And yet it's the irony of the paradox is land is a powerful factor that adds on to uh, the powerful identity of uh, Dangam's upper caste uh, employer. And that brings us to the, you know, how intersectionality of a Dalit woman such as Thangam, being a widow, uh, being Dalit, being women, and without any land, has an in inversely proportional effect to her employer, who's an upper caste man, being mm -hmm. upper caste, being a man, being a landowner, being wealthy. So I feel that it's uh, the gender differences are extremely clear or really uh, intricate uh, in both the texts. Of course, I'm just looked at uh, Shankarni's The Group of Change for now, but yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you. It's, which kind of kind of leads me to my next question about the question of agency. I mean, how does agency operate uh, in these two texts that you have looked into? Yeah, um, so there are so many instances of agency in both texts, and it's, it's agency or resistance towards microaggressions and macro is there. So mm -hmm. the two instances that I mentioned in my talk uh, where, you know, the elder is uh, giving the food via a string, but sat infuriated. And as an act of rebellion, she wanted to touch the food. Of course, mm -hmm. she didn't, but she was she thought about it. And another instance that I say is where Bama is expected to move to another seat in the bus. Mm -hmm. um, but Bama doesn't. She sits even more firmly in her seat. So these are like microaggressions that are depicted in the text and how um, the characters resist it or take back uh, agency. But mm -hmm. I call them passive acts of resistance because these acts of resistance do not really change the existing social order, do not offend it to a major extent. However, there's resistance shown towards um, macroaggressions. Uh, for example, um, in the group of change, there are two lovers from two different caste groups who decide to set aside the caste feud and get married. And mm -hmm. uh, Ambedkar has mentioned on several occasions that Shastra, caste, and endogamy are the three pillars of patriarchy. And uh, endogamy is still practiced with honor killings on the rise. So uh, for the characters to come together despite of caste divisions and get married, I feel it's a major offense to caste, caste ideology. And the uh, among the lovers, the woman is uh, from an upper caste family. And she stands up to her family by slamming the logic of caste practices. And I feel that's another example of how, you know, relational nonconformity uh, to caste practices are. Existence is a form of taking back agency. And you see those in uh, these characters, how they respond to uh, various uh, instances and uh, caste discriminations. And I think another prominent uh, resistance and form of agency is education. Mm -hmm. uh, for most of you who know Group of Change, you know that the central character, Gauri, she wants to be educated. She'll do anything to be educated and she sees agency in it. And the, there are people around her who says that education is the way forward. Go for it. But one of the striking uh, characters for me is Chandra, mm -hmm. who is a Dalit character. And uh, he is leading uh, the workers' union. And he teaches his fellow colleagues to sign their names. 
And I found that such a striking aspect of um, existence and agency, because to be able to sign your name is to show, is to take back a certain agency or power, especially signatures have a legal um, uh, angle to it. So I found that to be, um, you know, something that's a very strong example of resistance and simultaneously taking back agency. Uh, yeah, hope that. Yes, yes, definitely, yes. Yes, maybe I'll just, do I have for the last question or maybe I'll just ask the last question here and then turn oh, up yeah, the, sure. the floor. So yeah, so basically I was wondering, I mean, it's a, you know, enter thesis and you obviously didn't have time to kind of um, touch upon many things. I was wondering how, along with the, you know, the surnames and then body and then <clears throat> spaces and so on, what other mediums or what other sites are there that kind of, um, that are kind of sites of uh, cast performativity, if you can just touch upon it a little. Yeah. Um, so I've mentioned that these texts uh, show caste performativity. It's what inspired me to look at this idea, what mm -hmm. the texts are showing. It really navigated me into it. So the texts themselves show caste performativity, but the text and the act of writing itself mm -hmm. is a form of resistance. Uh, like I mentioned, performativity is a dynamic process. It, mm -hmm. it allows agency scope for change. And hence, the the writings and literature itself is a radical experimentation and a form of performativity. I was uh, interviewing uh, this uh, Bengali, uh, amazing prominent Bengali writer, Manohar Mali Biswas. Um, and he mentions uh, how his family were manual laborers and uh, they had a discussion on whether he could be actually educated because they didn't have the economical means to it. Mm -hmm. But he got himself educated by the financing through some of the other way through scholarships and other meritorious ways. And he is now a prominent author. And his writing, when he took it to the then mainstream publishers, many publishers said that nobody would read his work and hence completely ignored or neglected or you know, denied him the opportunity to be published. So then he and a few others set up a publishing house called Chatur Prabhunia in Calcutta, which is still ongoing and predominant. And so the act of writing and publishing itself is, I feel, um, a transformative dynamic process like performativity. Really? And uh, if, even in my thesis, I look at uh, genre performativity. That is how, how these writers, self writers use genre or experiment with genre. Because if you look at uh, the group of change, it's a novel. But then you have author's notes that was published by Shivakini eight years after the publication of Group of Change. And the author's notes is written from the perspective of a character in the group of change. And through many incidences, you see that this is Shivakami's life instances, what Shivakami has witnessed. And there's direct links to the author herself there and how the group of change was also autobiographical. So then, you know, is it an autobiography? Is it a biography? Like Pramod and I would say a community biography. Is it a memoir? Is it a testimonial? It's none of these genres, but it's all of these at the same time. They have gone beyond standard conventional um, so, uh, autobiographical conventions as well to a, something that is particular to their um, experiences. So the idea of performative, cast performativity is shown in the texts, mm -hmm. but the whole overall writing itself is dynamic and performative in nature, where it's not just signifying something, there's also an action expected. Um, I, I remember Arvind Malagati mentioning that if Obviously, Dalits will read his work and uh, have solidarity. But if non-Dalits can read it and they can change, that means he has become successful in his writing. He has achieved something that he set out to do. That's all. Thank Great. you. Uh, Bye. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. It was really wonderful. I'm looking forward to reading your interview because I often have a tendency to kind of work with text as if they uh, you know, exist in vacuum without any authors and so on. So it would be interesting to look at... Um, read uh, authors basically, I mean interviews. Uh, I just don't want to kind of, I, we don't want to kind of hog the floor, hog the limelight as it, as it were. I mean, if uh, Nicole or Marina can jump in and yeah. Absolutely, I was just about, <laughs> and Alpurna, yes, you can read my mind. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you both so much. Uh, it was just wonderful, it was such a treat. It was just so kind of both, uh, you know, stimulating, but also very relaxing to hear you talk about the work because you've done so much work, you're so, knowledgeable about what you do and I think you both really you know you represent a new generation of Dalit literary scholars 
really kind of pushing the boundaries, yeah? both in terms of, I mean, Purna, you're looking at genres, you know, almost all the texts that you work on <laughs> have next to no, no kind of scholarly analysis of them at all, even though they're kind of popular and widely read. And I mean, um, Surya, and I think when I first heard about your project that you wanted to kind of, you know, use draw on Judith Butler <laughs> in the analysis of Dalit texts and castes in particular. <laughs> How's that going to work? And I think it's, it's really exciting, isn't it, to kind of keep trying new things. And that's, that's really quite wonderful. So I, I also don't want to hog the floor. Um, so, you know, please, uh, if anyone wants to ask a question, you can you feel free to raise your hand. But in the meantime, I think I'll, I'm going to read the question in the chat. Uh, sure. Shall I do that? Because I think it, it, and otherwise, in the recording, no one will actually know <laughs> what, what the question was if I just asked to read it. So this is from Sirat Fatima, in our, um, who is actually a doctoral candidate at the University of Manchester. And uh, she says, thank you for the extremely insightful presentation. Uh, I had a question regarding the idea of space in Dalit literary texts. While communal mohallas exist on class, caste-based lines, how do they operate as sites of power relations, for example, in regards to gender, within their geographical boundaries? Does gender further ghettoize individuals in the community? I think yes. that's for both of you, isn't it? Yeah. Surya, do you want to go ahead or do you want me to kind of Well, first? you can start off because for me, what's jumping out is the term ghetto, but at the same time, I, I can also, after you, I have something that I would like to contribute yes. to, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a wonderful question. The thing is, yeah, I'm looking at... Uh, space or the uh, the urban space uh, at a particular historical juncture, I suppose, 1947, 1940s, 40s and 50s and so on. And during this time, uh, as far as the gender question is concerned, I mean, the Dalit women were very kind of vocal and very active in the Ambedkar politics. So in that way, going onto the street, going into protest, you know, participating in all this 1942 uh, scheduled caste federation and so on, these are all kind of, they're very much invested in the political process. So in that way, they're also kind of uh, defying and kind of transgressing the um, caste boundary, so to speak, and the kind of interconnected gender boundary. But in contemporary India, it, it, I mean, it's again another question that, you know, in, in, in cities like Delhi, you have all this, uh, all these kind of gated communities where, you know, even if you can pay uh, Dalit or a Muslim cannot uh, own a flat in a particular locality. So that kind of things still continue, unfortunately, in India. Uh, and yes, as, as far as the gender question in contemporary India maybe uh, is concerned, I, uh, I'm not sure how one should look at it because, yeah, I look at a particular, uh, I look at space at a particular uh, historical point, but uh, these days I am not sure how one should look at vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis gender. I'm sure space is something which is not only communally segregated or segregated on the basis of caste, but it is also kind of segregated uh, on the basis of gender or gender is kind of a very much... Um, uh, part of it, but uh, I'm not sure how I, I, I look at it, <laughs> to be honest. So if I can uh, contribute to yours, uh, Purna. Uh, so to add on to what you were saying, I was thinking that, you know, in any space, I mean, uh, gender is an issue still. It's not like uh, uh, women have been uh, or still take on a powerful role anywhere you go. Gender discrimination still exists no matter where you go. And that intersectionality of uh, women's experiences, in this case, Dalit women's experiences, is something that is extremely relevant and uh, continues to be something that, um, that Mark, or uh, as uh, I think it's uh, Gopal Guru says, that you know, Dalit women need to talk differently. It comes out through their texts. And uh, I'm also thinking about how uh, uh, certain texts such as this fall into this trap of being abject or victim narratives, especially when it's from a Dalit woman, it victimizes the narrative even further by looking at it as victim narratives or abject tropes. You need them at the same time because um, there is something specific in particular about their situation and about their experiences, and that needs to be represented in one way or the other. So what could be considered as abject tropes still continues to be relevant and hence needs to uh, be articulated, even if that falls under ghettoizing or it ghettoizes their uh, narratives. But how else would you do it if you don't speak about it, even if it feels recurrent? And I feel the fact that there's so much experimentation happening with writing, 
shows that they're trying to do something radical and different from what another person has done, from what even another Dalit writer has done. So it's difficult to homogenize them at the same time. Because I talk about Shivagami, I talk about Bama. You look at their text, two different texts. There are similarities, but there are these differences at the same time. And I think we need to like celebrate those differences while we are recognizing their sameness. Of course, I'm quoting, uh, I'm quoting Audre Lorde here, uh, the uh, black lesbian feminist poet. So I hope that uh, answers some part of your question. <laughs> Well, I can't speak for Sirat, but I think the, the, those answers were really rich and e exciting. And I mean, you're absolutely right. I think you both touched on it in, in, in some ways. The, the, these questions keep changing, don't they? And because the spaces keep changing and, and the context keeps changing and the contexts are slightly different everywhere, you know, over time and geographically. Absolutely. And yes, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I've got so many questions, but I will do them. Oh, and, and Sirat, yes, thanks. You. Uh, there is a question, however, by uh, Diba Zafir, and I think that's also a really interesting one. It's quite specific. Um, they ask, would style of dressing, keeping a moustache, and even riding a horse substantiate the argument of caste as performance? I believe that would be to me. So, um, so yes, of course, because um, let's look at style of dressing at the moment, because that's what's popping out to me. Uh, uh, so in these texts, I, in uh, The Crip of Change, the main, one of the main characters, Kalamatu, he tries to uh, change his way of dressing and it's clearly mentioned in the novel uh, that uh, he's doing it so that there is a certain um, association with a Brahminical tradition, wearing uh, the three um, lines on the, on the forehead and another character as well. He explicitly states that he's doing, he's trying to do a job of um, hiding his caste identity by dressing a certain way. And all of these come as caste performances, uh, which again, like I mentioned, you know, you're making it tangible. Caste is not essential. So you have to make it essential. You make it essential by bringing it to a concrete, visible and a tangible level. But in this case of uh, uh, mimicking, in this case of Kadamutu and uh, one of the characters, Gango, when trying to mimic uh, upper caste um, dressing style, it's mimicry. And we know that mimicry uh, is not something that is long lasting. And Ambedkar has mentioned it as well. At one point where Sanskritization, uh, or mimicry is something that will only keep you or oppress you further because you're never going to be the same. Maybe alike, but never the same. So style of dressing and of course, the way you're uh, carrying yourself up does come under caste performances. But what constitutes upper caste uh, dressing style, all of this is determined by caste ideology. Hope that answers yeah, some I part of it. Yes, I just wanted to add that, you know, as far as riding a horse and so on is concerned, I mean, these are all kind of, you know, contested uh, things these days. Uh, we often see police giving protection to newlywed bride and groom riding a horse and so on. So I, I suppose that, you know, civic space as a road or street as a civic space becomes a site of political, uh, site of caste or to city, I suppose. And, you know, by riding a horse or by demanding to... Um, you know, walk through these streets. They are these Dalits are also kind of asserting their civic rights, basically. And uh, you know, within the caste society, even we do not want even uh, Dalits to even ride a horse. So it kind of speaks a lot about the incivility within caste uh, society. So by kind of demanding or kind of uh, asking police protection or kind of uh, uh, riding a horse and so on is also assertion of uh, basically citizenship rights. Because if it is a street, if it is a road, then it is it is public. It is for everyone. It is not for sovereigners. Yeah, I'm just checking the chat again. Yes, people like like it's some kind of passing as a form of survival. But you know, like uh, Purna has said, things are changing. You know, where you were asserting your identity by grabbing the civic rights that you have. You know, you're a citizen of the country. You have as much as right to be equal and free as anybody else um, in the country. So you know, you assert that form by making your uh, your events visible. Like Purna mentioned in his uh, presentation, you know, you're using songs, you're using political performativity and, you know, projecting it, you're making it visible that this is uh, what we believe in as a form of resistance and agency. Yeah, just to add on. <laughs> 
Absolutely, and I and I can see now everyone in our you know Benil Biswas has has put on quite a few you know a few questions in the chat, and I think that's probably where we'll leave it. But you know, so I, I think so. Let's let's tackle Benil's questions, you know, and thankfully they're in the chat, so <laughs> you also have a reminder. You don't have to remember what I say, but I'm just reading it out while you think. So first one is how has uh, women's participation in the Samadasa Nick Dal. Um, how has how have how, how have women participate? How has been the women's participation in the Samadasani Gal? Yeah, that's a very interesting question for Purna. Then the second question: Does individuated autobiographical narrative of Bama perform the function of collective consciousness? Okay, excellent. Yeah, I think that is I'd say that is for <laughs> yes, that's, that's for Surya. And then uh, for both, do, does Butler's performative theory of assembly to might help us to understand the phenomena of narrativization. I'm wondering whether the third, maybe um, Benil, if you have time to elaborate on the third question, because it, even in my head, that's not entirely clear what it is, while <laughs> Purna and uh, Surya have a go at the first one. Yeah, well, thank you very much for that question. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Yeah, as I said, I mean, uh... Women, were Dalit women were very much uh, part of the Ambedkarite movement. Uh, personally speaking, I mean, uh, uh, Purna Bai um, Vasan Moon was Vasan Moon's mother was, you know, such a uh, wonderful, strong figure uh, in the life writing. Uh, there was this another uh, labor leader, basically Dalit labor leader named Radha Bai Kamle that uh, Vasan Moon talks about. She was uh, very uh, vociferous I and mean, very vocal about. Um, the vocal about Dalit's rights and so on. At the same, in one of the speeches, in fact, uh, she says that no, no matter what happens, we'll snatch our uh, rights, you know, birthright, which is, you know, getting gaining dignity and so on. So these are all vocal, very vocal Dalit women. And um, in fact, at one instance, uh, uh, Vasan Moon mentions that when Ambedkar used to travel from uh, from other cities to Nagpur, uh, all the women from the community, uh, they used to, you know, dress well and then as if they're going into a marriage ceremony and, you know, call each other out and, you know, go in a procession to uh, welcome Ambedkar and then bring him into the Vasti. So these are all kind of instances that demonstrate as to how Dalit women were so much um, into the Dalit movement and into the uh, into the conferences that he organized, you know, Cyril Kasfan conferences and so on. I mean, uh, yes, Cyril Kasfan conference in 1942. And then the, you had the Hindu Mahar riot basically um, that happened. And then uh, there are many instances in the instances in the life writing where whereby you know, Dalit women kind of fought against the uh, quote, unquote, quote unquote Hindus uh, during the riot that happened and uh, yeah, between the Mahas and the uh, quote, unquote, quote unquote Hindus. So yeah, women were very much part of the movement and um, they were, uh, you know, they were uh, basically agents, political agents in the movement rather than followers or something. I hope I tossed up on the question. Uh, and what was the last question about uh, Judith Butler's performative theory? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't know much about um, you know, the theory of assembly and so on. So I don't think I'll be able to uh, honestly say something on that. Okay, then I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to help uh, with that there. I'll try. So uh, the first question, Purna, that's Purna's area. So I, I'm, not, I'm not looking at that. The second one, however, does individual autobiographical narrative of Obama perform the function of collective consciousness? Of course, there are, throughout the, uh, uh, the narrative, you have this shift between I and we. And uh, it's not it's not fixed where this that transition happens, but there is this personal uh, uh, pronoun being used, I, and then there's a collective pronoun being used, and then there are moments in the beginning where Obama says that we have been through this, and then towards the end of the narrative, you say Obama saying we need to move forward, we need to rec recognize our rights, and we need to be educated, and we need to get uh, ahead of this. So of course that um, uh, narrative of Obama does indicate a form of collective consciousness uh, just by the usage of those uh, collective pronouns. Uh, for the last question, the Butler's performative theory of assembly. So I didn't look at the performative theory of assembly that closely uh, for my text, but I'm aware of what it's talking about in terms of the assembly of physical bodies and the corporeality of uh, uh, bodies and its performativity. And it's similar to the second question where you see 
how uh, you have a collective consciousness uh, that springs through these narratives. And you, you can also see that in the narrative, narrative, narrativization of the text. They're not the same. They do it differently. But at the same time, the corporeal performativity comes through these texts or what uh, Butler calls gender performativity. And I think um, uh, the theory in, uh, theory in flesh, a theory in flesh by uh, Gloria and Zaldua, Sheri Moraga, and some of your um, uh, feminist critics have talked about this idea of theory in flesh uh, that comes through women of color, their writings. Theory in flesh means uh, writing the body, writing what is corporeal to you. And I feel uh, it comes through the narrativization as well. For example, this, the, the, this, the talk of rape, the talk of how it affects you physically. Like in the grip of change, you have the upper caste uh, employer's uh, uh, thoughts on why he, not why, on his uh, act or assault and rape on Thangam. And you have Thangam's perspective as well on it. And you see how the two differing perspectives and how it influenced and impacted her. So I feel the corporeality or the gender performativity of these corporeal bodies specifically to check. Uh, through gender comes through the style of writing and in the text. Hope that answered the question a yeah. bit at least. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank I you for the time, Surya. These are fabulous areas to work on and it has led me to think a lot of things about it. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to mention one book basically um, regarding SSD and uh, and um, Dalit women. There is this book named uh, We Also Made History by uh, uh, by Urmila Power and uh, uh, Minakshi Moon, translated by Vanda Nasanalkar. Wonderful book. So basically, there they argue how as to how Dalit women basically contributed to the Ambedkar movement. So at one instance, uh, they write that you know it's um, you know all these Dalit women they work in um, basically day you know wage laborers, but you know he, he was still insecure um, life, and they for whatever scarce money they had. From this money, they kind of uh, funded the Ambedkar movement. Basically, yeah, the meticulously narrated as to how these women uh, funded, contributed to the uh, fund for organizing this scheduled caste federation uh, meetings and conferences and so on. So it is not only their participation in the movement, but in many ways, financially as well, they contributed. Brilliant. Oh, thank you. Thank you all so much. And then, ha, ha, Vanilla, nice to, <laughs> nice to see you. It's, it's lovely. Vanilla is also planning on having one of these uh, talks, so that's fantastic. And uh, I just want to quickly, um, be, while you're still here, uh, announce that on the 7th of March, you know, we'll have a, a wonderful conversation with um, the filmmaker Seral Murmu. Yeah, so he's an Adivasi filmmaker, and I think that's going to be really fascinating. It's sort of a very open floor discussion. So um, it, it's much more participatory. Yeah, so I'm hoping that you'll all be there. And, and happily, you know, ask him all kinds of questions because he's he's wonderfully open and and he he loves talking about his work and so but yeah so that was the advertisement for the next one <laughs> as is my duty <laughs> and uh, I just wanted to thank you both so much honestly Purna Surya it's just been absolutely wonderful it's it's been so exciting and I think yes absolutely that's right it's follow <laughs> Ben Eden in the applause and absolutely it's it's just been absolutely wonderful and I, I know your your work is both so rich and um. I can't wait to actually see it in book form <laughs> soon. So uh, I'm, 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 I'm really pleased, you know, that, that you know, this has worked out so well and, and loads of thanks also from the, you know, in the chat. So yes, it's, it's been really wonderful and we're all very much looking forward to seeing you in the next uh, Open Border Seminar. So thank you all. <laughs>